Welcome. My name is Helen Harrison. I'm the director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton, Long Island, and I'm an advisor to the Texpressionism exhibition that will be opening in April at the Southampton Arts Center. I'm here with Suzanne Anker, who is one of the exhibition participants, and she and I are going to talk a little bit about her work and about specifically the items that will be in the included in the exhibition. So hi, Suzanne, it's good to see you again. Good and to see you, Helen. I'm, well, I'm just so delighted that this show is coming about because I have worked with Colin over the years on the Texpressionism concept, which is, is his, and the idea that technology is a tool, is a means to an end uh, to express an artist's personal vision, I think is very important to emphasize because I think technology often gets in the way. People concentrate on the medium and not on the message. How do you feel about the role of technology as a, as a tool for an artist? Well, I, I think it creates new ways of seeing. Um, the digital revolution um, is essentially is the latest phase of the intersection between art and technology. Uh, we can even go back to the camera obscura, which Aristotle talked about. We could look at the photography revolution in 1839. We could look at video art um, uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s. And, and now we have a paradigm shift. We have the ability of zeros and ones to create images. And in many pieces of my own work to create actual sculptural objects. So this is really a new way to see the world, uh, similar to the invention of the microscope to see the hidden uh, worlds that are not on view. I think the hidden world for the artist is the world within the ideas, the concepts, the feelings, the intangibles that are the substance of the art. And what we see is a, almost like an outer shell that the artist has created to express those concepts. And I think that from what I've seen of the, the pieces that like the ones behind you representing the, the Rorschach, I think that's another tool that was used to explore the inner mind. And how did you decide to adapt the Rorschach blot as, as a signature image? Well, for a number of reasons. Uh, after my work with genetic iconography, I moved into neuroscience a bit. And uh, what struck me was the way in which the brain processes images. And I came across several images that I have worked with before, certainly the chromosome. Um, the butterfly, um, and of course, the Rorschach. All of those are symmetrical images um, that essentially deal with the way the natural world operates to some degree. And each of these images is a transformative image. The chromosome is a bioarchive of, of ancestral echoes. Uh, the butterfly goes through metamorphosis uh, to create a winged creature. And of course, the Rorschach test is, uh, is a projective device used by psychologists to articulate, help the, the patients articulate their hidden desires. I think it's interesting too. Uh, Andy Warhol did a series on them, and the the fact that they have this kind of visual fascination is is I think key to their appeal that they that they look like things that they're not. So there is a lot of subjectivity involved in in uh, interpreting them. I agree. It's the ambiguity of the image uh -huh. which artists are very much interested in. 
Um, and other artists like Annette Messanger has used the Rorschach. Um, it comes up not only as an image, but it's also a cultural metaphor. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense of being double-sided, um, it's been described uh, in the popular culture and in the news reporting. Um, and I'll just read you uh, one description that talks about its metaphorical associations from a review of uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey in which the reviewer said about the Space Odyssey, called it a searing inkblot of modern thinking man's apprehension as the ultimate place of technology in the celestial scheme of things. Um, and it goes on and on in its sort of cultural metaphors. Uh, there's another one that uh, from the New York Times that characterized the photographs of um, Diane Arbus as Rorschach images of her subjects. So those are some of the ideas behind the pieces as well uh, in terms of their cultural uh, significance. Now, everyone knows what a Rorschach test is, whether or not it is has validity is another point in question. <laughs> um, it certainly has been um, used, it is the most used projective test um, that, that people have taken. But when Herman Rorschach actually decided to use this test, it was for schizophrenic patients. It wasn't for a clear psychological uh, projective test, but it has been adapted through culture to essentially uh, be used by psychologists. Now, Rorschach invented this based on one of, a, uh, one of his favorite pastimes, which was a game called Blotta in which you take a piece of paper, uh, you put some ink on it, you fold it in half and you get this symmetrical structure. So it uh, actually predated Rorschach. Uh, yes, not for psychological reasons, but for a children's game, yes. Uh, which I liked um, very much. So um, I think that the question of the Rorschach being three-dimensional, which I'll show you some images of shortly. And these are the pieces that will be in the exhibition uh, in Southampton, is like holding the imagination in your hand. When mm -hmm. you essentially um, can pick up a three-dimensional object that supposedly has projective kinds of ideology within it, it becomes a whole new set of metaphors. And, um, and uh, what interested me about turning the two-dimensional ink blots into three-dimensional objects was that when one thinks of an ink blot, one thinks of a uh, random kind of geometry but it's all mathematical. And I was been able to create these objects because the computer could, could translate um, this coastline essentially it, through mathematical variables. Um, so I felt that, um, that for me, it fit into this idea of um, neuroscience and the way in which F, uh, fMRI technology can actually see the brain in action. 
So Actually, when you look at the scans of the brain that you have on the wall behind you there, you can see the similarity because partly, I guess, because of the um, sym symmetry, but also just some of the forms that kind of echo the Rorschach. And I wonder why you felt it was important to make them three-dimensional. Because no one has ever done that before. <laughs> <laughs> That's what artists always like to break new ground. <laughs> and because when they are three-dimensional, they look very much like body parts. They look like and artifacts or fossils or things that were sort of primitive, buried in the soil for generations, and here they are. That's correct. Well, I'm gonna share my screen and show you a few images right now and then we can continue our conversation okay let's take a look at this if we kind of go back to its origins and this was a show in new york city in 2002 called the butterfly in the brain and these are silkscreen prints images of brain scans uh, butterflies and Rorschach tests, all about these projective techniques that have to do with a kind of uh, invisible internal reality. And here are a couple of the prints uh, that you can see close up. And um, in these MRI scans of the brain, we see an image that looks like a butterfly or a chromosome. Um, so this kind of typology between symmetry was what I was looking for. And um, as I move forward in this um, show, I decided I'd make a few ink blots myself. And uh, I have this MRI scan of the brain. I have a single butterfly in each one of these pieces. It's the same butterfly, but well, yeah, you can just see it sort of uh, superimposed on the central symmetry. That is absolutely correct. And it's superimposed on some Rorschachs and it's superimposed on some of my own ink blots. And what we see here now is the relationship of figure ground uh, that we all talk about in art that we can essentially change an image by what is underneath or on top of it. And here you can see that up close. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not look like the same butterfly, but is the same butterfly. So again, it has to do with opticality, which was the first uh, foray into the unseen. It's also interference. Uh, you've got the one pattern interfering with another and creating a third pattern. That is very good point here. Um, and I think that visual interference uh, is so important to, to information, uh, particularly through technology, th particularly through machine learning, in which I have learned in some of my other works um, how, the, how the machine reads information and gives me new clues about making things. Uh, this has happened in other series of my work where the machine actually makes its own mind up, <laughs> if it has one. <laughs> um, and here are some of the Rorschach pieces. They initially start out from Herman Rorschach's uh, ink blots, then a third axis is created by the use of a software program called Maya, so that we have a back and uh, front of these pieces. Um, I gave them my um, own names. Uh, this one is called Wolf, 
And as you can see in the back of the piece, that's very seashell-like. And uh, I've also made them, um, I've, I, I've used the rapid prototype pieces to convert them into bronze. Mm. And um, these have a certain weight to them, which again, you can hold your imagination in your hand. Um, here are some larger ones. This is, will be at the show here. Um, these are, are quite big. I would say they're about 10 inches wide as compared to the smaller ones, which are probably about four inches wide. And what happens now is that on this scale, other metaphors take place. Uh, one could look at this as even a pelvis or yeah. some kind of bone structure. And uh, that is not evident from the two-dimensional ink blot or even the small three-dimensional ones. What's interesting, as you look at it more closely, you can see that although it has a kind of symmetry, it's not actually totally symmetrical because some of the shapes are varied as they would be in an, in an ink blot where it doesn't exactly duplicate one side and to, to the other. So you've got little bumps and ridges and knobs and things that are on one side and not on the other side. And yet, just at a glance, it looks like it's totally symmetrical. Absolutely. This is sort of a whole theory about the culture of the copy or the clone. There's no such thing as an exact copy. Hmm. And um, even through technology, whether it's photography um, or rapid prototype sculpture, each time you make one, they're slightly different. Even if you tissue culture plants uh, hmm. through molecular means, you are not getting exact copies. So that is a very important point that you raise because we like to think of the ability of things to be perfectly symmetrical or a perfect copy when there is no such thing as that. And um, what I've done here is to create a small video. Satie's music. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that video shows the brain in action mm -hmm. and the kind of core choreography of thought uh, that takes place when we view works of art. Uh, and that includes art made by uh, technology. Well, I mean, I, I have to disagree with you slightly because I don't think the art is made by the technology. I think the artist makes the art and then the technology enables it. Really, it comes from your, your impulse to create something and then you find the means to do it. And of course, Colin and I are both fond of quoting Jackson Pollock in that regard. He said, technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. So your statement comes to you through these forms that you've been able to develop through technology. I, I agree with that. And, and I think without, though, uh, the ability to use 
3D technology, which is rather new, mm. uh, I could not have made the 3D Rorschach test. Now, when I was thinking about what can I do with 3D technology, um, I had to think for a very long time, what would be a significant image that would essentially give me new metaphors? And, um, and as it turned out, it was because I had access to this technology that I was able to realize this project. So, so this is a 3D uh, printed, is that how it's done? Yes, mm -hmm. it's 3D printed, yes. Then when you uh, arrived at the, uh, the image that you wanted, you how do you translate it from two dimensions to three? Well, you run it through a software program because basically Maya, which is the program we use, creates a third dimension, okay? What you do normally in a painting is you have a two-dimensional uh, surface, uh, axes, and what happens if you wanted to make a painting three-dimensional, uh, then you would have to create a third axis. And through this software, you can extrude and uh, extrapolate um, the data in order to make a third access. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what interested me first was using the technology and what could I do with it. And right, that, rather than simply replicating something, but to create something entirely new using yeah. that special uh, medium. So if you, and I thought it's interesting, you have some of them that are small enough to hold in your hand. So they are, have a tactile dimension as well. Absolutely. And they're really a pleasure <laughs> to, to put in your hand, particularly the bronze ones, because they, you know, you feel kind of um, the weight that the imagination has as a kind of storehouse for the future. Wonderful. So will people at the Southampton Art Center actually be able to touch them? Will you, will you have them on open display? Well, that sort of depends on um, what the Southampton Art Center allows. <laughs> because, uh, you know, in normal circumstances, it's do not touch the art. Mm -hmm. Well, but also, they, uh, we don't want them to uh, have legs, so to speak. <laughs> you got that. <laughs> but maybe there's one that they can, they can hold. Maybe it's at the guard's desk or something. <laughs> and um, they could be um, that they could feel what this is. So I think, I think that the, um, the role of of technology and how you're talking about, it's used by artists as a form of expression um, is very much of the moment. And um, many artists whom I know um, are involved in this endeavor. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's interesting to note also, since I'm also the chair of the fine arts department at the School of Visual Arts. And uh, when this technology was first introduced to students, they were very hesitant about it. They thought that they wouldn't be able to make paintings anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have now uh, changed their mind and are gearing uh, mm -hmm. towards it and uh, making some really fantastic work. Well, you bring up an interesting point. I mean, as long as Windsor and Newton is still in business, they'll be able to make paintings, but will they want to? And of course, we've been down this road before. Painting had, has died and been reborn several times in, in my lifetime. But the fact that they're hesitant 
to experiment with it. I think I understand that when I was in art school back in the 1970s uh, and 60s, we had a vacuum forming machine and I was doing sculpture and everyone wanted to play with the vacuum forming machine. But why would you do that? unless it was to get a result that you couldn't get any other way. That's so correct. first you had to figure out why you wanted to do it, and then you figured out how. So that was the part of the process. Just having the, the machine there didn't make it interesting. It had You had to make it interesting. I, I agree with that. And a lot of artists mistake the technology for the art. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my, my interest in techno-based art is to really break open um, different and new tropes of images that, um, that could not have been achieved any other way. That, um, you know, we had seen this also when plastic came out as a uh, sculptural material and there were many exhibitions about artists who use plastic. Well, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the point is, yes, the material has a language, but it also is deeply embedded in the history of art for its iconography. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what kinds of iconography are developing right now because we have many tools at our disposal that we hadn't had when we went to art school. Yeah, quite right. But there are also uh, the consideration that once you've decided, <clears throat> excuse me, once you've decided that you want to use this technology and you have an aim in mind, you have a goal for it, that this is going to give you X, Y, Z result, when you learn the nuances of the technique, that might lead you in a whole other direction that you hadn't even envisioned before. So as with, as with any medium, it has its own life, it has its own qualities, its own properties, its own character, and you might not have even thought of it until you actually start manipulating it. I agree. And I've continued to use the rapid prototype uh, machine for newer sculptures uh, that are quite different and um, and that I'm always surprised by the outcome uh, mm -hmm. because it's not a hands-on experience. It's kind of a mental experience mm -hmm. of, of, of choosing the different ways to model the item. Um, and you're not sure what you are going to get as a final result. Right. It's a collaboration with the machine. And, mm. and sometimes the machine teaches you things that you have not thought about. Mm. Well, I think it's the same is true with paint, um, learning how to use paint, learning how to use clay, learning how to use a camera, all of these technologies and it's it's been you could even consider the pencil a technology that sure. there are and, and some people handle it better than others you know people say well well why did why did jackson pollock use liquid paint because that's what he needed in order to get the result he was after but it led him in a direction that he probably could never have foreseen i agree with that and i think again embedded in in pollock's work is an element of surprise, uh, but also the way he used line as a gravitational force mm -hmm. so that the bigger ideas of human consciousness, if not the universe itself, um, are also embedded in his metaphors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he needed liquid paint in order to do that.
And similarly, you think of Lee Krasner's uh, collages. She needed to destroy earlier work in order to create new work. And I found that when I first saw it in exhibition in the 1970s, at first I was appalled because I thought, oh, it's like killing your children and <laughs> cut, up, cut up your art. And then I thought, are you crazy? Of course, she made something much more interesting and wonderful out of it by, by rethinking how she used the material and what kind of effect she could get with it that she hadn't envisioned when she created the original work. I agree. Actually, I'm going through a process like that right now in um, this period of work I've made over the last couple of years during COVID. Um, it's a series of work called After Eden, and I have been photographing my um, huge outdoor space uh, and garden and collaging many of the mm. elements to essentially mutate the images and and i think that the world we live in um, necessitates that kind of thinking because uh, in some ways we are connected in new ways mm -hmm. so the kind of cut and paste techniques that started out with say surrealism um, and then readapted through Photoshop, um, really changed the ontological status of what an image is. Image A collides with image B to create image C, which is different than A and B. So, um, so I think that Krasner's work in this case, and, and certainly, uh, earlier artists, uh, their use of, of collage or cut and paste, which is a big word right now, even on our computer, hmm. um, is, um, is a prelude to what is happening in the digital revolution. So do you feel in your own work that uh, you're never satisfied, that there's always something else you can do with what you already have? I think the hardest part about my own work is what to do next. And I think when you end a series of work or as I work in a way that are project-based series of works and when those are complete, or fairly complete, I may pick them up again three years later, okay, mm -hmm. with a fresh idea. But the hardest part is really beginning a new body of work um, that starts from ground zero. Oh, I wouldn't say anything ever starts from ground zero. <laughs> you always build on what you've done before, even if it's to reject it. I mean, you know, you've got this image bank in your head and you know you're going to go back to it. <laughs> well, that is true as well. And, you know, the proclivity uh, that one as an artist or even a human being has towards uh, those things that spark their attention or create a sense of wonder uh, are the same things that they were always attracted to, even as children. So it's well, that's just an interesting it. point, because I think a lot of people, you know, the, 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 I think it was Picasso who famously said, I have to learn how to draw like a child because of that open mindedness and the lack of constraint that you find in children's art, that you want to have that kind of intellectual and emotional freedom to express yourself in ways that you're not, so that they're not self-censoring, that mm -hmm. you don't want to put the brakes on, on your own imagination. That, that is true. So artists are really just grown up kids. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> 
Um, well, have you anything else you'd like to tell us about the work that you'll be showing at uh, SAC or about your development in general? Well, I've been showing a lot of my work internationally right now. Um, and I have, um, I'm in a show at the ZKM um, Museum in Karlsruhe, which is based on art and technology. I also have a large installation going up at the Kaffa Art Museum in Beijing, um, as well as several national shows coming up. So uh, this is a very rich time in my life for my work, and I am very grateful to have the time to make it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Suzanne. It's been a delight speaking with you, and we look forward to seeing your work at the Southampton Art Center. Well, thank you so much.